Well, thanks very much for having me and for coming out this morning. A, a word about the format today. Um, last night I gave a more formal lecture. Today I, I took colloquium a little more literally, so I'm hoping you have a, a, a little more free-flowing pedagogy, the, thus the whiteboard. I hope to use the whiteboard a little bit. Um, and I don't even mind really if there are questions as I'm going on. If you, you know, feel free to raise your hand and we can have some more discussion. Um, certainly we'll have time for Q&A at the end though as well if you want to hold questions. There is a handout at the back uh, that can help, I think, a little bit follow along a little bit of the discussion. So the topic today is Dietrich Bonhoeffer and partic particularly what his social ethics. Um, I'm going to have some qualifiers about even those few terms as we go along. But I want to introduce Bonhoeffer and his social ethics within uh, a little bit more of the proximate background of what was going on in his life and work. He was born in 1906, and he lived till 1945 in Germany. He was a German Lutheran theologian. Um, he had two doctorates, as they do in Germany, a habilitation and a, then an earlier doctorate. He taught at the University of Berlin until uh, the early 1930s, and then he had a kind of turn towards the church. Uh, he had pursued a, a career of academic theology, and then he started to become focused particularly on theology for the church, and that took up the uh, a main part of his interest for the rest of his life. Towards the end of this period, we obviously have the outbreak of World War II. Uh, at the very end, he, he turns, in a sense, away from the church. There's a middle period here between 1931 and 1938 or 39, where he's really focused on uh, the church struggle in Germany. And then he increasingly becomes involved in more direct resistance to Hitler as the war goes on. So there's a kind of turn towards the church in the early part of the 30s and then a turn away in a sense. Uh, he resigns as pastor, for example, as his ordination, in part because he doesn't want the church to be complicit in anything that he ends up getting involved in uh, in terms of conspiracy and so on. But theologically speaking, the more proximate background for Bonhoeffer's social ethics, which he develops in a number of texts. Most importantly, uh, his so-called ethics, which he was working on at the time of his death. He was executed by the Nazis in, in the Flossen, Flossenburg concentration camp two weeks before its liberation, April 9th, 1945, so this month in 1945. Um, but at the time of his imprisonment, leading up to his imprisonment and his execution, he was working on an ethics text, uh, and that's the main part of what will form uh, the basis for the text today that I'll be quoting from and referring to. So th as I said, the, the more proximate theological background is the so-called Bart Berner debate, uh, which broke out in the early 1930s, published uh, in German, and then it, basically immediately translated very quickly into English. And this is a debate over natural theology between Bart and Brunner. How many of you have heard of the Bart Brunner debate? Okay. So I'll give a little primer on what's going on in the Bart Brunner debate, um, and we'll fill in some of these boxes on our chart that's in your handout. I'll also put it up on the board. But first, I just want to uh, take a minute and give you uh, a little bit of background about what natural theology is, what some of the related doctrines are, and so on. One important way of thinking about natural theology is as, a com is as part of a complex of doctrines that go together. Um, so you could have natural theology is in a response to um, the reality of natural revelation. So natural revelation may be a sort of given, some knowledge of God that um, exists that we can perceive in some sense from the things of the world, from nature. So natural theology then would be a kind of human response to that reality, some construction of ideas about God, uh, about the nature of God, and so on. And then also another closely related idea is natural law. And that, um, again, is... is it can be construed in a couple different ways. One way of thinking about natural law is as the moral aspect of natural theology. 
So natural theology may teach you something about the doctrine of God, perhaps, uh, in a more or less def definite or distinct form. Natural law will have something to do with your moral obligations. Um, and we'll see how these kind of things go together in Bonhoeffer specifically, not necessarily the natural part, but how theology and ethics or theology and obligation go together. But there's something that happens similarly in the kind of natural law, revelation, and theology construction or complex here. That is, if you recognize that there is a creator and that the creator has uh, created the world and everything that is in it, then there is an immediate corresponding recognition that there's some responsibility to that creator, some obligation that you have. Um, and so this is the kind of dynamic that you have between natural revelation, natural theology, and natural law. So there are a complex of doctrines that go together. Sometimes you'll see people talking about natural law um, and not natural theology, or sometimes you'll see, see people talking about natural theology and not necessarily natural law. They may be emphasizing one or another aspect, either the moral or the doctrinal aspect. Um, but they are best understood, I think, as doctrines that kind of fit together in a complex of interrelated doctrines. Uh, there is a sort of uh, revival of natural law thinking among evangelicals and Protestants in particular. Another part of this background is that in the 19th century, there's a revival of a kind of Thomism in the, in the Roman Catholic Church. And part of that revival includes a revival of natural law thinking in Ro among Roman Catholics. And the perception was, at the return of the 20th century, that natural law was a kind of Roman Catholic way of doing ethics. And so for Protestants, the alternative was something like, maybe you've heard this, divine command. And so it's a little bit of a character, characterization, but not too much to say that at the turn of the 20th century, natural law was a Roman Catholic way of doing things, and divine command became the kind of Protestant way of doing things. So there was a kind of a bias against natural law thinking among Protestants. Part of that bias, uh, especially as the 20th, 20th century went on, is in large part due to the outcome of this Bart Brunner debate, which we'll be talking about. So as I said, there's a sort of revival nowadays, maybe within the last 10 or 15 years of Protestants uh, engaging in some more positive or critical way, natural law ways of thinking. And one of those texts uh, that's important is called Retrieving the Natural Law. That's a book by da J. Darrell Charles. And here's how he defines natural law. Natural law is the moral aspect of the penetrating arrow of general revelation. So this is Charles's definition. Natural law is the moral aspect of the penetrating arrow of general revelation. So I think that fits, uh, generally speaking, within the kind of complex of doctrines that I've tried to sketch there. So that's the kind of working definition that you can use, a basic definition of natural law, I think, um, that we can use as sort of a background. So what's at stake in the Bart Brunner debate in the early 1930s? Well, uh, you have, it, with Karl Barth, a very important theological figure in the, in the 20th century, a, an inauguration of a new theological mo movement or moment, uh, especially with the publication of his, his commentary on Romans in 1919. And early on, Barth and Brunner are viewed as collaborators in this new movement, sometimes it's called neo-orthodoxy, um, or the dialectical theology, or something along these lines. So there's a Bart Brunner kind of uh, collaboration, or at least co-belligerence, you can see early on. The Bart Brunner debate marks a moment of separation between the two. And the debate really is about natural theology. So this is the context of the debate. It's over the question of natural theology. So Brunner publishes a, a short essay in which he says that the pressing theological issue of the day in, in the early 1930s is to return to a true natural theology, a natural theology in line with the theology of the, Ref of the Reformation, the post-Reformation period, uh, and more broadly within uh, the true natural theology of the Christian tradition. Bart's answer is the famous no, or nine. In which he denies that there's any place for natural theology in a truly Christian way of thinking. So again, the acknowledgement, I would say, of the differences between the orders of creation, 
and preservation for Brunner are the key point. Um, so the way that these two things relate to natural law is to think of order's language as natural law language. So there's some sort of order of things that is inherent in the created and preserved order of the world that reveals to us the way social life, uh, that the human life ought to be pursued. So Brunner says, this is really the important distinction. So you've got orders of creation here on your chart, orders of preservation, and a related, closely related doctrine of the Imago Dei. This is something like what your chart looks like. And I think I've got Bart here, Bonhoeffer, in the middle because he mediates between the two, and uh, Brunner. So the key for Brunner, and he sets this position out first, is that the way to recover a true natural theology is to distinguish clearly between orders of creation and orders of preservation. Now, what is the difference there? He says the distinction between an ordinance of creation from a mere ordinance of preservation relative to sin, such as the state, is made for sound theological reasons. It is necessary for a Christian theolo theologia naturalis, that is, for Christian theological thinking, which tries to account for the phenomena of natural life. So there's an explanatory aim for this doctrine. You're trying to explain what are these structures that we tend to see in human life throughout the ages in various contexts. Uh, how do we account for good that remains in the world, even in a fallen world? It seems like there's some good that's out there. So here, uh, in Brunner's statement, we see the relative importance and higher value given to the perceived orders of creation as opposed to orders of preservation. Orders of preservation for Brunner are things that come into existence only because of sin. So he gives an example here of the state. The state comes into existence for Brunner because of sin as a restraint on sin. The, the, the civil magistrate bears the sword because of the reality of sin and the pervasive corruption of human nature as a restraining force, a preserving force. So Brunner will affirm the existence of both orders of creation and orders of preservation. In fact, he thinks it's the true task of the theologian of his day to distinguish these two and to give an account for their origins theologically. Likewise, he will affirm in a more or less <laughs> analogous traditional reformed sense uh, the, ex the ongoing existence of the imago dei in the fallen human person. He uses the language of formal and material distinctions, um, which you could see as something maybe analogous to more classical reformed ways of distinguishing between uh, what's lost in terms of the image of God and what's retained. Uh, but any, in any case, he does affirm a corrupted and yet still, uh, in some sense, uh, existing Im image of God in the human person. For Bart, uh, as you can tell from his title, I won't go into a lot of the polemic. I mean, Bart's, Bart's response in, is in many ways very powerful. It's driven by the recognition that Bart has of the danger of the rising Nazi ideology in Germany. So this is also in the background. Um, part of the, the dynamic here is that Nazis are appealing to natural theology for their ideological doctrine. So this is part of the rhetorical background, which we have to understand why why Brunner thinks it's so important to distinguish these things, because he, he thinks that you can save a kind of natural theology from the Nazi uh, corruption of it, and why Bart will say, no, 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 all of this is wrong. All of it leads to idolatry. All of it leads to the glorification of the, of the, of the, uh, the state and so on. And so that's his answer all, the lo all down the line. In the context of, of Bart's case, um, he, he draws a pretty clear line between liberal theology, the tradition of 19th century, especially German theology associated with figures like Friedrich Schleiermacher, who would emphasize uh, something more positively, it seems, about the, the state of the human person in the fall, the image of God, and so on, a point of contact between the creation and the creator in the human person. Uh, he links that kind of a doctrine with Roman Catholic Thomism, optimism about the nature of the human person, 
a kind of Pelagian from Bart's view, a Pelagian orientation where there's something good in us and if we do justice to that then we, we will uh, reconcile ourselves with God and so on. He links all of that in a, in a, in a narrative leading from basically Schleiermacher, uh, Thomas Aquinas and Schleiermacher on down to the Nazi ideology. So this is a very powerful rhetorical case that he's making in the context of the Mark Bernard debate. The outcome of the debate, um, John Bailey, the Presbyterian, who's a contemporary, uh, judged it this way. He said that um, Bruner had the position that was closer to being the truth and yet was less clearly stated and not very well argued. And Bart was more clearly incorrect and yet was much more strongly stated and much more effective. And um, I think it's safe to say that, that Bart essentially wins the debate in terms of the broader theological world. So Bart is persuasive to many people that there is some sort of a genetic link between affirmation of any of this and the necessary kind of idolatry that, that attends to something like, like Nazism and the, ideolo and the ideology there. Uh, that in, that following the Bart Brunner debate, a colleague of mine, Stephen Grable, in his work on natural law calls it uh, the inauguration of a period of Bartian hegemony uh, in Protestant theology. So basically from, well, 1919, if you consider that as a kind of revolutionary turning point of the neo-orthodoxy, through, say, 1990. I mean, it's most of the 20th century, you've got this kind of this Bardian uh, presence is this major influence, especially on ethics and questions of natural law and natural theology. Now, where does Bonhoeffer fit in all this? Well, the one thing I would say is, traditionally speaking, Bart and Brunner are understood as, as on one level or another, reformed theologians. So Bonhoeffer is different in the sense that uh, I think he's much more clearly aligned with a kind of a Lutheran confession. Um, I'm not sure of his status as a confessional Lutheran, um, although I, I think he's very much oriented towards the Lutheran tradition. Certainly figures like Luther and, um, and Augustine are very important for Bonhoeffer. Those are some, some pretty important theological influences. Now for Bonhoeffer, he charts a kind of mediating position between these two. Um, he will say no to orders of creation, yes to orders of preservation, and uh, maybe on the Imago Dei. Now let me say a little bit, little bit more about that. Um, the traditional reformed way of understanding the Imago Dei that I referred to earlier, Brunner used the language of formal and material. Um, we'll talk about the, the narrow and the broad image. So the narrow image usually refers to something like original righteousness, original holiness, the state of integrity pre-fall. That, the reformed will say, is lost. We've lost that state of innocence, that state of integrity, the original holiness, the righteousness that we had. More broadly speaking, we retain, even if in somewhat broken or corrupted form, the image of God in our rationality, in our sociality, and so on. We do remain creatures who are in relationship even if it's broken. We do image God in a broken and, and flawed way. So the Reformed will make a distinction between this broad and narrow image. Traditionally, the Lutherans do not uh, uphold that distinction and define the, the image of God more narrowly. So very often you'll see Lutherans say, no, we lost the image of God, by which they mean what the Reformed mean by saying we lost the narrow sense. Um, Bart goes a little further, especially in the Bart Brunner debate. I think he moderates later on. But in the context of the Bart Brunner debate and for what the polemical case he's making here, he's going to say, no, we lost everything, so on and so forth. Bonhoeffer is much more um, moderate on this point of the image of God Partly, he's rede he redefines the image of God as consisting in, in um, the analogy of relation between human beings. So he'll, he'll put sociality as constitutive of what it means to be part of the image of God. You can see some Trinitarian echoes there. Um, with respect to the orders of creation, certainly early in the 1930s, Bonhoeffer thinks um, there's a problem with trying to divine or discern the things that were there before the fall and the things that were there after the fall. Given the limits, the noetic effects of sin, the, the effects of sin on our intellect and the way that we know things, he's skeptical that we can really do the kind of thing that Brunner wants us to do that has clearly distinguished him. So he says, 
that for, for people like Brunner who argue on the basis of the orders of creation, they don't realize in all seriousness that the world has fallen and now sin prevails and that creation and sin are so bound up together that no human eye can any longer separate the one from the other and that each human order is an order of the fallen world and not an order of creation. So it's an order of preservation of some sort of natural life, some sort of limited good within the context of a fallen world. These are the orders of preservation for, the, for Bonhoeffer. The orders of preservation are the, is the language that he uses early on in his career, early in the 1930s, in his Genesis lectures uh, and some other places. Other places he calls them laws of life. Um, and I should say here that uh, orders language, especially orders of creation, is a traditionally Lutheran way of speaking about natural law. So Lutherans may not talk about natural law, but they'll talk about orders of creation. And it functions in that kind of way. So orders of creation language is a Lutheran kind of way of talking about natural law. So what does this mean for Bonhoeffer's way forward? Well, as you can see, I argue here that he sort of takes a, a mediating position between Bart and Brunner. Ultimately, within the context of the debate, given the vociferous nature of Bart's nine, the line really has to be drawn here, I think. Anybody who says yes to any of these things is, is going to be uh, on the other side of Bart. You have to agree with Bart on all these points in the context of this debate to agree with him. If you say yes or maybe to anything, you're on the other side. You may not have all the same positions with respect to these things, but you're, you don't agree with Bart. <coughs> so this is the background of the way that Bonhoeffer approaches the question of theology and ethics um, from these early 1930s period up to his mature theology. So a couple things about Bonhoeffer's way forward. I referenced this a little bit earlier, the unity of dogmatics and ethics, the unity of doctrine and ethics, how these two go together. This is also an emphasis you find in Karl Barth. Um, and that is, what you think about God has implications for what you think you owe him, and so on. The way that Bonhoeffer formulates it is in a question that he raises throughout his career. And the question is, who is Jesus Christ for us today? Who is Jesus Christ for us today? This is the central animating question of Bonhoeffer's ethical and moral thinking, as well as his doctrinal thinking. Who is Jesus Christ? So if the answer, for example, is Jesus is Lord, well, that's a doctrinal, con confessional sort of profession. It has doctrinal content. Jesus is Lord. You affirm that. But it also comes with immediate ethical implications. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar, not Hitler, not whomever. So this is where you get this kind of unity between dogmatics and ethics. You also get a unity for Bonhoeffer in the way that he approaches personal and social ethics. The traditional way of distinguishing personal and social ethics would be personal ethics refers to the persons at the individual level of personal relationships. The norm there is love. Just uh, Social ethics has to do with the relationship of social institutions amongst one another and between individuals, perhaps, and the norm there is justice. And so you get this kind of dichotomy, or at least distinction, between personal and social ethics. That's the tr traditional way of construing it. Bonhoeffer resists this kind of a dichotomy. Um, so I'm calling it social ethics just because that's what I think it's analogous to, but he would not want to call it social ethics necessarily. And this is why, and we'll conclude with this point too later. He says, human beings are indivisible wholes, W-H-O-L-E-S, not only as individuals in both their person and work, but also as members of the human and cremated community to which they belong. So the background of this, in part two, is the uh, traditional Lutheran distinction between the two kingdoms. Okay, so you can see here where the two kingdoms might be construed along this personal social divide. Uh, and Bonhoeffer is really concerned that you get a kind of secularism that will attend to a really strong version of this. So he wants to make it clear that human beings are indivis indivis indivisible and that they exist in all these, the context of all these different kinds of relationships, but that you don't have one kind of morality that attends to the, to the personal level and another that attends at the social level and that you, you know, the, the two do not meet. So it's in this context that I'm going to say a couple things about 
what you might say are personal ethical kind of doctrines. Uh, in terms of Bonhoeffer's way forward, before I get into the, what I'm calling the divine mandates and what he calls the divine mandates, which is his later language for orders of preservation. They're materially the same thing. He changes the terminology a little bit. So vocation for Bonhoeffer, um, and this is definitely opposed to contemporary and more secular understandings of vocation, is calling, is to be understood as the basis of the Christian life in its entirety. So Bonhoeffer, echoing a similar sort of question, who is Jesus Christ for us, is what does Jesus want to say to us? What does he want from us today? How does he help us to be faithful Christians today? Elsewhere, Bonhoeffer asks, what could the call to follow Jesus mean today for the worker, the businessman, the farmer, or the soldier? He's very concerned about the relationship of a doctrine-like vocation to the practical Christian life. So for Bonhoeffer, calling is the basis of the Christian life. It's the calling that all Christians share. And the, the basic fundamental nature of that calling is to follow Jesus Christ. That's what we are called to do. We are called to follow Jesus Christ to a life of discipleship. That's the primary sense of vocation for Bonhoeffer. Only in a secondary sense does vocation mean some particular aspect of our life, like being a business person or a farmer or a soldier. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what does this following after, this discipleship, mean? He says following Christ me means taking certain steps. The first step, which responds to the call, separates the followers from their previous existence. A call to discipleship thus immediately creates a new situation. Staying in the old situation and following Christ mutually exclude one another. So the call places you in a new position, a new relationship to your sovereign, the lordship of Jesus. It's something that's laid on every Christian, and it's a call that includes bearing the cross. The cross is not the terrible end of a pious, happy life, says Bonhoeffer. Instead, it stands at the beginning of community with Jesus. Whenever Christ calls us, his call leads us to death. The death of sin in the old Adam and life in communion with Christ. So one way of understanding this is that the human person pre-fall had existed in relationship both with God and other people. The fall severs this relationship to some extent. And what Christ does, the call to call Christ, uh, to follow Christ, puts you in a new position where uh, Christ now comes to you and restructures, reformulates those relationships, puts you in relationship with people again as mediated by him. I'll say one thing, or a couple things really quickly about this other doctrine called uh, vicarious representative action. This is uh, the other piece of what it means to follow Christ for Bonhoeffer at the individual level. It's the German word Stellvertretung, and it takes three English words to translate it, vicarious representative action. Uh, what this means is that we stand as representatives of Christ and our various responsibilities in our relationships with others. Let me unpack that a little bit. So, so vicarious representative action, Bonhoeffer says, is the new life principle of the new humanity, and it's the way that we image Christ in our personal relationships. So just as Christ was a vicarious atoning, uh, his vicarious atoning work on the cross between us and God, we are called to be like Christ in, the, in that sense in our relationship to other people. Um, I'll say a little bit more about relationship to that and develop that, I think, a little bit in context of the divine mandates, because that might make it a little easier to understand, I think. But Bonhoeffer will say that we need to become a Christ to the other in this sense. So on to the divine mandates, which are really the structures of Bonhoeffer's social ethics. These are the key structures of Bonhoeffer's social ethics. The starting point, as you might guess, and this is one of the hallmarks of this era of theology, is it's very Christocentric. Uh, the, the grounding for Bonhoeffer's social ethics is Christ himself. So the subject matter of a Christian ethic is God's reality and revealed, revealed in Christ. Christ becoming real among God's creatures. So this is his basic de definition that uh, retains consistent. Christ as Lord. This is the answer to this question. Who is Jesus Christ? 
And how is Christ's lordship exercised? This is the social ethical question. Christ's, Christ's lordship is exercised over the world through four distinct mandates. Marriage, sometimes called the family. Work, sometimes he calls it culture. Church and government. These are the expressions of God's commandment, the concrete commandment in Christ, the sole authorization for ethical discourse. So earlier, he, we had talked about orders of preservation. This is the definition that he had given there. All orders of our fallen world are God's orders of preservation that uphold and preserve us for Christ. They are not orders of creation, but orders of preservation. They preserve us for Christ, and they have Christ as their origin, essence, and goal. So let me give you a little bit about each one of these. What, what does he mean by marriage and family, work culture, church, and government? Marriage and family is perhaps one of the best examples of what he might be meaning by making a distinction between creation and preservation orders. Um, Bonhoeffer would say that post-lapse marriage is simply not what pre-lapsarian marriage was. Um, and he points particularly to the advent of divorce as an aspect of this. So he'll say that uh, the, heart, the, um, the allowance that was made for the hardness of human hearts in the Old Testament, the law, the law of Moses that allowed for a certificate of divorce is evidence that the, the nature of the institution has changed, that the allowance has changed. Uh, there's an analogy of relationship here. So Bonhoeffer makes a big deal about the relationship of Adam and Eve as constitutive of the image of God, that in the image he created them, and that this relationship in some way sh images God. So Bonhoeffer will point to marriage as a kind of foundational social reality. The family is the foundational social unit of human life together. He'll say that family and marriage and procreation go together because we are bodily. We are created and we have bodies. So bodiliness and being human indivisibly belong together, says Bonhoeffer. He'll talk about the home in this context. Unlike an animal shelter, a human dwelling is not intended to only be a protection against bad weather and the night, as well as a place to raise offspring. It is the place in which human beings may enjoy the pleasures of personal life and the security of their loved ones and their possessions. Eating and drinking serve not only the purpose of keeping the body healthy, but also the natural joy of bodily life. Clothing is not merely a necessary covering for the body, but is at the same time an adornment of the body. Relaxation not only serves the purpose of increasing the capacity for work, but also provides the body with a measure of rest and joy that is due it. In its essential distance from all purposefulness, play is the clearest expression that bodily life is an end in itself. Sexuality is not only a means of procreation, but independent of this purpose embodies joy within marriage in the love of two people for each other. As all this indicates, the meaning of bodily life never revolves around being a means to an end, but is fulfilled only by its intrinsic claim to joy. So bodily life, particularly as is expressed in the context of family and love and marriage and relationship, is a valid end to itself, even if it is a mundane reality, even if it is a bodily reality, a temporal reality. To show how true this is for Bonhoeffer, I want to point to a concrete example in his life. Um, at the very end of his life, he, uh, he was in prison for his role in a couple of different things. Uh, he was actually arrested for his involvement in a, in, a, in, a, in a movement of some Jews to Switzerland to free them from danger. Uh, and then he was only later implicated in a plot to assassinate Hitler, the so-called Abwehr conspiracy. Um, but before he, he uh, went into prison, just before he went into prison, um, he got engaged. Um, and the engagement continued during his prison, uh, his existence in prison. And we have some of the correspondence between Bonhoeffer and his fiance in this, in this collection, Love Letters from Cell 92. And these only came to light after his fiance's passing. His, her sister, I believe, made them public. Um, her name was Maria von Wittemeyer, and she was much younger than Bonhoeffer. But this is what he says about the nature, his view of marriage as an important social reality. 
He's writing to Maria. So now to your letter. You can't possibly imagine what it means to me in my present predicament to have you. I'm under God's special guidance here, I feel sure. To me, the way in which we found each other such a short time before my arrest seems a definite indication of that. Once again, things went according to human confusion, but divine providence. It amazes me anew every day how little I have deserved such happiness. Just as it daily and deeply moves me that God should have put you through such an ordeal this past year, and that he so clearly meant me to bring you grief and sorrow so soon after we got to know each other, to endow our love with the proper foundation and the proper strength. Moreover, when I consider the state of the world, the total obscurity and obscurity shrouding our personal destiny, my present imprisonment, our union, if it wasn't frivolity, which it certainly wasn't, can only be a token of God's grace and goodness which summon us to believe in him. We would have to be blind not to see that. When Jeremiah said in his people's hour of direst need that houses and fields shall again be bought in this land, it was a token of confidence in the future. That requires faith, and may God grant it to us daily. I don't mean the faith that flees the world, but the faith that endures in the world and loves and remains true to that world in spite of all the hardships it brings us. Our marriage must be a yes to God's earth. It must strengthen our resolve to do and accomplish something on earth. I fear that Christians who venture to stand on earth on only one leg will stand in heaven on only one leg, too. This captures, I think, the fundamental worldliness in the best sense of Bonhoeffer's orientation is to ethics. There's an inherent goodness in the sense that must be affirmed in these social orders, that must be recognized in these social orders. There's a saying that's apocryphal that's attributed to Luther, and it actually arises out of the Nazi period. Um, Luther supposedly says, uh, even if I knew that the end of the world was coming tomorrow, I would still plant my tree today. Well, for Bonhoeffer, who knew that the end of the world for him might be coming tomorrow, would st still get him married today because there's something inherently good about the institution of marriage, something um, world-affirming, life-affirming in it. We see something similar in each of the other mandates. So for in the case of work, there's something that's world-affirming in the context of work. Bonhoeffer makes a distinction um, between creation in a number of senses. Primary creation for Bonhoeffer is what God does to create ex nihilo, to create the cosmos out of nothing. Secondary creation is what God does to order and arrange that material creation. Tertiary creation is what human beings do in response to God's primary and secondary creation. So sometimes he calls it tertiary creation. Sometimes you may have heard it called, called to, uh, referred to as co-creation. This is the responsive uh, moral agency that human beings act as workers, as productive workers in the world. So he says, the work founded in paradise calls for co-creative human deeds. Through them, a world of things and values is created that is destined for the glory and service of Jesus Christ. It's not a creation out of nothing like God's creating, but it is the creation of new things on the basis of God's initial creation. This is the foundational understanding for Bonhoeffer of work that persists even in the context of sin and the curse, uh, which he goes on at some length to discuss as well. The church for Bonhoeffer, uh, in some ways, is the primary sociological reality. His first work was called Sanctorum Communio, and it was an exploration of the church as a primary sociological reality. And this is an interest and an orientation that you can see. He's doing that in the context of academic theology, but you can see it existentially in the turn towards the church that I referred to earlier. Um, you can see it in his writings like Life Together. He's concerned about the reality of church in the world. Why? Because the church is the primary um, expression of Christ as embodied in the world. But he will talk about the state as a kind of independent institution that has its own sort of responsibilities. So there's a really important essay called The Church and the Jewish Question in the early 1930s, where Bonhoeffer talks about the church and its orientation, its responsibilities, its social responsibilities. And he talks about these three ways that the church can act, three possible ways in which the church can act, particularly with respect to the state. The first task of the church is to ask the state whether its actions are legitimate 
and in accordance with its character as a state, that is to throw the state back on its own responsibilities, to prophetically call the state to do the things that the state is supposed to do. The second action is to aid the victims of state action. The church has an unconditional obligation to the victims of any ordering of society, even if they do not belong to the Christian community. So Bonhoeffer recognizes that social order is always going to be some, to some extent broken and corrupt. There will always be victims. There will always be marginalized. The church has a primary and unconditional obligation towards those who are poor, oppressed, and marginalized. Now, these two actions of the church are things that it does everywhere and always. But there's a third action for the church. And it's the rarest and most serious because it involves action, quote, not just to bandage the victims under the wheel, but to put a spoke in the wheel itself. Such action would be direct political action. It's only possible and desirable when the church sees the state fail in its function of creating law and order. So when the state has become a function uh, uh, of disorder and anarchy, rather than law and order, the church may indeed have a role to directly intervene. This can only happen in a kind of confessional situation where the state is in the act of negating itself by its very actions. And Bonhoeffer clearly thinks that this is what uh, the German government is doing under the context of National Socialism. So in that context, Bonhoeffer affirms the government as an ordinance of preservation, an order of God, the magistrate in the traditional Protestant sense of being a minister for the good. He uses government to distinct, as a distinct turn, turn from uh, a state because he's talking about the generic kind of role of governing rather as opposed to this or that particular political order. So the term state means an ordered community. Government is the power which creates order. So state would be a particular instantiation of a form of government. So that's why he's talking about government more generally. So the government, just as all of these orders have their origin, their essence, and are related to Christ in terms of their orientation. <clears throat> but how does the state serve Christ? The servant of the government to Christ consists in the exercise of its commission to secure an outward justice by the power of the sword. This service is thus an indirect service to the congregation or the church, which only by this is enabled to lead a quiet and peaceable life. He's referring here to 1 Timothy 2.2. 2. So certainly the persons who exercise government ought to accept belief in Jesus Christ, but the office of government remains independent of the religious decision. It pertains to the responsibility of the office of government that it should protect the righteous and indeed praise them. In other words, that it should support the practice of religion. But there is a secular character. It remains religiously neutral, attends only to its own task, and can therefore never become the originator or foundation of a new religion. For if it does so, it disrupts itself. It affords for protection to every form of service of God which does not undermine the office of government. So to put this all together, in conclusion, we find that for Bonhoeffer and his social ethics, the person has one calling, to follow Jesus Christ within the context of a number of other callings, you could say. Calling with a capital C in the context of callings or relationships, aspects of that calling with a small c. So those would include the family, work and social life, the order of common life, the church and the government. We have the single person who exists in the context of each one of these relationships. For Bonhoeffer, each one of us is an individual that is unique because we are the only person who exists in a unique confluence of these relationships. I'm the only person who's a husband to my wife. I'm the only person who is a father to my children. So each one of us exists in each one of these spheres or institutions or mandates, but we each do it in a unique way. There's a kind of a, a matrix that the human person represents. It's a confluence of each one of these different kinds of relationships. The key for Bonhoeffer, though, is that each one of these is cruciform in its calling. So the, the cross stands over and unites each one of these callings for us. It's a cruciform calling. 
So Christ stands not only between us and God, but between us and other people. He restores our relationships with others. <clears throat> what does this mean for vicarious representative action, which I know that I didn't exp- explain too well? Let me conclude it with this point. Robin Lovin, who's done a lot of work on Bonhoeffer, describes Bonhoeffer's idea of vicarious representative action as an act based on a sound reading of the facts, a type of civil courage which can be shared with others, and yet properly understood, the venture involves a risk of personal corruption so great that only one who believes in the power of a Christian grace is likely to undertake it. So this is the nature of our responsibility to each one of our individual, conf- the confluence of our, of our callings. So in this way, Bonhoeffer, I think, does live out Luther's famous dictum, Sin Boldly, which you've heard. Ultimately relying only on the vicarious representative atonement of Jesus for salvation, and not on the ethical righteousness of any of these individual human works. Now Luther's dictum begins, be a sinner and sin boldly, but it concludes, believe in and rejoice in Christ even more boldly, for he is victorious over sin, death, and the world. As long as we are here, that is in this world, we have to sin. So Bonhoeffer would say we can't avoid the responsibility that goes along with being in this place of responsibility, these vocations that we have. That, I think, is the key insight of Bonhoeffer's social ethics.